Thank you so much, Stevie Mack and worship team, for being here with us today. When I knew that it was going to time out for Tim Blake, our uh, worship leader, to be on vacation, but Stevie Mack being here, Stevie Mack's got such a long history here. I thought, how appropriate, because we're, in, we're concluding this series, the one about the jars, where we've been talking about the mission and the vision of this church, one that Steve got to actually see you know, evolve from when he was a kid here all the way to being a worship leader for our youth ministry, and as God has sent him out to do ministry down in central Kentucky. It's really cool to see how God works in that way. I want to sum up this series. If you're here for the first time, you're like, say what? There's jars everywhere in this sermon series called The One About the Jars. Well, we've been looking at our mission and vision as a church and looking at different passages in Scripture. And as it turns out, the Bible has a lot of things to say about jars. And when we started this in week one, we began looking at the first recorded miracle of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And that was the miracle where he turned water into wine. And there were these six giant jars that would normally have water for cleaning in at this wedding. And he turned those jars into jars of wine. But the way he did it is he told servants to go get water and to fill those jars up with water. And so one of the little details that kind of you can miss is that so many people were a part of making that miracle happen. Servants had to take their smaller or medium-sized jars, go to a water source, fill their jar with water, and then bring it to the bigger jars and, and dump it in. And who knows how many times they had to do it. And it was such a good way to begin this series, to be reminded that if we all just do what God ask us to do individually, but we do it together, miracles happen. It's, it's, just, it's, lot, it's a lot less complex as we think it is to be a part of God's work. It's just people being obedient, saying, oh, you want me to take my jar over there? I'll take my jar over there. You want me to bring it back here? I'll bring it back here. So that's how we began the series. And then week two, we looked at these four words that We've been talking about for years at Hickory Grove that we believe help us to remember what it is we're supposed to be doing as a church. Gather, grow, give, go. We, we gather and worship. We grow as individuals, but we also grow in groups. We give of our time, talent, and treasure. And we go. We go share our story. We go bless the community around us. We go bless the places where we work, where we live, where we play. We all do that. That's us being the church. That's us taking our little jars and making them a part of the bigger jars, the bigger miracle that God is doing in saving souls. Then in week three, we shifted gears a little bit. We heard about what God did at kids camp this summer, and it segued us nicely into talking about breaking barriers. We started moving away from bringing your jar to breaking your jar, Breaking down barriers, we, we really lean into how God has uniquely called us as a church to reach the next generation, that we've always been about reaching kids, students, families, people that have not been reached with the gospel yet, and people that God is bringing into this community. And many years ago, we built a family life center and opened it up for that purpose, and then we talked about our future campus that we will one day, hopefully, Lord willing, have, but between now and that future, we, we have growth issues. We have space issues. So we announced last week that we're preparing to gather and worship in our gym starting Easter weekend of 2024, Lord willing. We're still praying, we're researching, but that's what we're working towards. And that's a lot like the woman who had her alabaster jar. The most famous broken jar in the history of humanity is that broken jar. We're still talking about it 2,000 years later, and she brought this expensive perfume. A year's wages is how much it was worth, and she broke it, and she poured its contents onto Jesus. And it just is a reminder that we are still called today to make personal sacrifices for the mission that God wants to accomplish. She proclaimed the burial of Jesus that was going to be happening. He literally said that's what she did, and that's what she was a part of. But she was just showing love. And that's what we do too. Now that segues nicely into what we're going to be talking about today. We're still going to talk about breaking jars. Can you believe there's yet another big passage in the Bible that talks about breaking jars? It's pretty famous. It's, this one's buried deep in the Old Testament. A, an amazing story of an underdog army of 300 troops defeating an army of 135,000 troops. 
So we find this story in the book of Judges in the Old Testament. We're going to be, uh, I'm going to share a little bit of the background. We'll look at a passage in Judges chapter 7 in a little bit. But I want to give you a little bit of a background. So the book of Judges kind of tells almost the same story on repeat. Israel didn't have any kings, didn't have a government set up. And they were living among other peoples and nations around them. And for a time, they would be obedient to God, and they would have a leader leading them, and that leader was called a judge. But usually at some point, often after that judge would die, they would find themselves worshiping the gods and goddesses of the pagan peoples around them instead. They would disobey God. They would rebel against him. And the consequences of that was that they would be ruled and oppressed by those other nations. And the rule and oppression would get so severe that finally Israel would cry out to God and say, Oh Lord, how long will we have to go through this? Help us, help us. And God would hear their prayer and God would deliver them. And the way he would deliver them is he would raise up a new leader, a judge, to lead them out of that oppression and would lead them to still obey God. And then things would be great until they weren't great. And then they would do it again. This was a vicious cycle, wash, rinse, repeat, that Israel was on. It was almost the same story, but different leaders, different circumstances. And what we're looking at today is a story of how God heard their cries because the Midianite people were so oppressive. It got really bad. They were impoverished, the book of Judges says. They were literally malnourished because of the oppression of the Midianites. And they cried out to God, and God heard their prayer. And what he did is he sent an angel of the Lord to a man named Gideon. When this angel comes to visit Gideon, Gideon is hiding in a wine press threshing wheat. Now, I don't really know exactly what threshing wheat is. I've heard a lot of sermons on it. You know, it's separating the wheat from the chaff, and apparently there's some work involved, and things get slung around to separate those two products. But the reason Gideon was doing it in a wine press is a wine press was kind of a pit. So you could kind of hide and not be easily seen while you're doing that work. Why was Gideon threshing wheat in a wine press? So he could be hidden. Otherwise, the Midianites, if they were to happen to see what he was doing, would take that food away from him. That's how oppressed that they were. So this angel shows up and says, and calls Gideon mighty warrior. Well, (laughs) yo, all right. So I don't have that big booming Stevie Mac voice, so I got to have a microphone. Um, So Gideon, hearing this angel call him mighty warrior, was like, what? (laughs) This was not, he was literally hiding food and himself from the enemy. But that's what the angel called him. So some of the things, if you know much about this story, there's a few things you may have heard of before. How many of you have ever heard of that phrase, putting out a fleece? Trying to maybe see if, y'all, I see some hands raised up. Yes, we put out a fleece to see okay, I think God wants me to do this, or I think I should do this. I think this is the right decision to make, but I'm not sure. So sometimes we'll put out a fleece. I've done that before too. You know, like, I think this is what I'm supposed to do, but maybe I flip a coin, and if it lands on heads, (laughs) something crazy like that. Or I'm going to ask God, okay, God, if you cause that to happen, then I'll know you're telling me to do that. That's what putting out a fleece is. And the reason it's called putting out a fleece is because Gideon literally put out a fleece. When he heard that this angel Lord was calling him to lead the Israelite people and to lead them out of oppression from the Midianites, he had lots of doubts. Is this really you, God, telling me to do that? So he got this piece of wool fleece, and he put it outside on the ground, and he said, God, if you are really telling me to do this, when I wake up in the morning, let there be dew on the wool fleece, but not on the grass around it, not on the ground around it. Turns out, God did that. Yay. I'm still not sure, God. Isn't this, isn't, isn't this how we work sometimes? Like, do you really want me to do this, God? Is this really what you're asking me to do? So I'm sorry, God. Let me do this one more time. But this time, 
when I wake up in the morning, let there not be any dew on the wool fleece, but be dew on the ground. And God did that too. So that was enough to convince Gideon that this is what he was supposed to do. But I want to pause for a moment. Gideon did something more radical than that before he even put out a fleece. And I've read and heard the story of Gideon and Gideon's army so many times in my life. But there's a couple of details that I've missed that I want to really shine a light on today. One of the bigger details that I missed was that before he put out this fleece, you know what he did? He did something really radical. His dad had altars set up to false gods, Baal, Asherah. And what Gideon did is he literally tore down those altars, took that material that those altars were made of, and built a whole new altar to the God of Israel. He took one of his dad's ox and sacrificed it on the altar. He worshiped God first. Then he had all of his doubts and put out the fleece. I think that's pretty powerful that he did that. And it was kind of a big deal. You can go back and read about it in Judges 6 and Judges 7. And the people woke up and saw what had done. Like, whoa, this is radical. What is going on here? And I figured his dad would be mad, but it turns out his dad defended him and was like, cool with it. So all was good. But that was the beginning of this journey that Gideon was on. So he puts out his fleece. He believes that this is God calling him to lead Israel out of oppression. And so he begins to gather an army. And he starts off with 32,000 men. And God tells him, that's too many. And you can read the details of how God did it on your own, but he eventually had Gideon whittle that army down to 300 men, going up against 135,000 in the Midianite army. So you can imagine Gideon might have been a little skittish about this, still having his doubts about what God was asking him to do. And God, knowing this about Gideon, told Gideon to go down to the Midianite camp. And what he will experience when he goes down to them and eavesdrops on them will give him the courage to continue to lead. So Gideon takes one of his servants, Purah, and they go down to the Midianite camp on the edge of the camp. And they happen to overhear two Midianites talking. One of them is, is sharing a dream that he, he had had. He had had this dream that there was this barley loaf of bread that came rolling into their camp, and it ran over their tent and collapsed it. The other friend says, surely this means that God and Israel and Gideon are about to beat us. They're about to defeat us. <laughs> it's almost like God is teeing Gideon up to say, Listen, even they believe it's going to happen. (laughs) And so Gideon goes back to his camp. And I want to read to you what he experienced when he goes back to the Israelites. We find it in Judges 7, starting in verse 15. And it says, when Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, get up. The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, For the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. They shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. Some details in that are so big. They held their position. They they smashed their jars, screamed a sword for the Lord of Gideon, and then the Midianites fled. They ran without them even charging. 
it goes on to say that the Midianites were thrown into such confusion that they actually turned against each other. And then as they led, left that camp, encampment, the, the Gideon army, Israelite's army, pursued them and defeated them. Huge stuff here. And it all started with jars breaking. 300 jars being smashed all together. But I want to point out to you another detail that I missed about this story. Because when you think about it, how about this for a good question? Where did Gideon get this battle plan? Like, where did he come up with, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give every single one of my 300 men a jar. And we're going to break it and blow trumpets and scream. And that's how we're going to win. <laughs> Where did he come up with this battle plan? And as I look at it, it's so subtle that you almost miss it. But in that very first verse I read to you, it says that when Gideon heard the dream and he heard its interpretation, he bowed down and he worshiped. He bowed down and he worshiped. So I want to say this. When we pause our lives to worship God in spirit and in truth, God will give us things to do that we would have never thought of otherwise. This is where we get the crazy God ideas that God wants us to do. This is where we get the idea that there's something maybe difficult that's going to require some faith that I need to do. This is where we get the idea that this is something I must make a change about, and it's going to take courage, and I can't do it alone, and I need God's power to make it happen. This is where we discover those things. We often can't come up with it on our own, guys. We can't be innovative enough to know exactly what God wants us to do at times. We can't be smart and clever enough. Sometimes, if you're like me, man, I wake up in the morning, I find myself hitting the ground running, and I'm doing and I'm thinking, and I'm task mastering, and I'm worrying, and I'm fulfilling, and I'm coming home tired, and then I wake up and repeat it again every day, and I don't do this enough. I don't pause enough and just worship God. I say, God, here's the calendar. Here's the task list. Here's my life. Like, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And we need to give that time to God to pause, to quiet down all the voices in our hearts and in our minds and listen. And that's when he reveals to us, hey, buddy, this has got to change. Hey, I designed you to do this. Hey, here's a burden I'm going to put on your heart. This is where we learn of the jar that he wants you to break, that he wants me to break in that moment of worship. That's where this victory began, was with worship. And then all the other things happened afterwards. And in Gideon's case, somewhere between hearing the dream and lining up his 300 troops, he worshiped and he heard the voice of God saying, this is what I want you to do. Give them all jars and just smash them and blow the trumpet, and I will take care of the rest. You'll see what I will do. Once you do the thing I'm asking you to do, then you will see the thing that only I can do. I will accomplish what only I can accomplish. I just want you to start by breaking this jar. Now, have y'all ever gone axe throwing before? Anybody ever done that? It's pretty fun. Um, I, it's so humbling, though. I've had people that I thought I could beat in axe throwing just humble me, man. They're like, flick, it sticks. Like, just to get the axe to even stick in the wood in front of you, are like, how is this not working, you know? It's a lot of fun. I encourage you to try it safely with family and friends. Go to a place and do it because they got all the safety things. And one of my favorite places to do it is a place in Florence called Full Throttle Adrenaline Park. So I've been there a few times doing some axe throwing. Me and my son Cameron did it for his birthday last year, this past his, his past birthday, I noticed that they had some other things that you could do there. They got some fast go-karts, but they also have a thing called a rage room. And this is where you pay someone else to go into a room and break stuff. <laughs> a 
it kind of makes me, in my mind, I'm thinking, I want to save some money and just break some stuff in my basement or something. You know what I mean? Uh, but this is on their Yelp page showing, as for some reason, I think this is such a funny picture when I saw it that I had to share it with you. There's grandma's lamp, a couple of baseball bats. Let's go crazy. And, and on their website, if you look it up, it's such a funny byline that they advertise. They have uh, on their webpage a picture of a group of people all geared up. And then their byline on the bottom says, smash your heart out. Smash your heart out. I, I feel that, right? Sometimes you just got to release. Sometimes you just got to do something to just feel that, all that stuff within you get out. And I just wonder if that's what it felt like for those 300 men, those jars in their hands, torches inside of them, trumpets in the other hand. I don't know if they felt confident. I guarantee some of them, maybe even most of them, thought, I might die today. <laughs> this might be it. I, I might die today. But in that moment, with those jars smashing, something was released. Years of oppression, starvation. How many of those men who had surrounded that Midianite army? By the way, one little detail in Judges 6 and 7 was there were so many Midianites in that encampment they couldn't count the camels. The camels were like sands of the seashore. We don't know how many camels there are. Somebody counted the troops, though. It's about 135,000 of them. That's what they were facing. So I guarantee I would have been shaking. I would have been holding my jar saying, this might be my last day alive, but I can't wait to smash something because of everything we've been through. All that we've endured being oppressed by those Midianites over and over and over. I wonder how it felt for them in that one guttural moment, smashing the jar, screaming, a sword for the Lord and Gideon, in that moment that, that there were things released out of them. And in that moment, all that poverty they had endured, the fear they had harbored, the hiding they had done, no more. Gone. Over. And replacing that was complete and utter hope. And Gideon told us to do this. <laughs> and Gideon said he talked to God and he worshiped the Lord and this is what we're supposed to do. So in that moment, replacing fear was hope, faith, trust, the possibility for something new, the possibility for victory to happen. And all they had to do was just break their jars and trust the Lord. And this is what I want to say to you today. Ultimate victory awaits on the other side of the jar that God is asking you to break. Ultimate victory. It's waiting on the other side. You may not know exactly how that's going to happen. You may not know the full journey of that. But it starts with you doing the one thing God did ask you to do, the, to actually bring before him the thing that he's asking you to break and saying, I will do it. I will do that. And there's something amazingly final about that when that happens. That when you break it, it's what's done is done. The woman with the alabaster jar that we talked about last week, she brought that expensive perfume, and once she broke the jar and started pouring it out, it's over. You can't put that perfume back in that jar. It, it's what's done is done. And the same for those 300 men surrounding that camp, that once the jars were broken, it was came on. A new chapter had started, and they had to trust and see what God was going to do next. And friends, that's the moment that I believe God calls each and every one of us to. Sometimes every single day, we have to make a decision. Am I going to break the jar God is asking me to break or not? Am I going to do that? So I'm asking you that, that question. What jar in your life does the Lord want you to break? What does he want you to break? We actually put it out um, on our church app, asked that question. And so if you have our church app, you might have gotten the alert. And we got answers from you and our own staff gave answers to that question too this past week. What jar might God be asking you to break? And we wrote them on this jar, several of them. They're good ones. I see the word control. 
worry, addiction, anger, body image, not surrendering to God, insecurity, family, time management, change, fear. I believe there comes a moment in our lives when God says, listen, that thing you're holding on to, it's time to let it go. It's time to break it. Sometimes it's something we treasure and we value, just like the woman with the alabaster jar. Sometimes it's something that's a barrier that prevents us from experiencing all that God has in store for us, but we're settling and we're just saying, you know what, I just can't, I'm angry and it's just who I am. You know, I'm insecure and it's just who I am. I have worry and doubts, but everybody has them. But maybe, just maybe, as you pray and as you praise, you can whisper, hear the whisper of God in your heart saying, hey, I want you to break that. I want you to shatter it. And I want you to finally let go of it so that it no longer has a hold on your life. And the thing about it is, when you break it, it is done. It is over. And I love this because you can't undo it. It's a moment that says, hey, we're now in this. This is happening. It's a burn the ships moment. It's almost like the baptisms we celebrate. You get dunked in the water and the whole world sees it and you're like, I'm all in with Jesus and I'm going to do whatever it is he is asking me to do. I don't know if any of you want to volunteer to put this back together for the next service. (laughs) (laughs) Turns out we made three, one for each service. It's very thankful for our staff making that happen. What's done is done. I love what Jesus said in Mark 14, 8 to the woman with the alabaster jar. He said she did what she could. Now, friends, one of those things written on that jar that I just broke may have really resonated with you. You may have said, man, I I got that too. I feel that too. And I want you to know you can't defeat it. You can't overcome it. But he can. Do you go? I encourage you. Read Google throughout Scripture. Find me one battle that somebody won in the Bible. Find me one battle that the Israelites won. They did never won a battle. It was always God. He is the one that brings the victory. And once we kind of get that through our heads, it changes everything. It causes us to realize that the best thing I can ever do is to bow down and worship him. To come before God and say, I can't break it, God. But I know that you can do all things. Show me what it is you want me to bring before you and break before you and let you take care of the rest. What is it? It might be a sin that you know has a hold on your life. It might be something you really value, but you're putting it above God. I don't know what it might be, but it starts with you hearing his voice and saying, I'm in. And I'll start by breaking, and I'll let you win the victory. So what I want us to do before we sing one last song together is just be quiet, be still, and listen for the voice of God. That in this moment, maybe just maybe in this room, or if you're watching and listening online, that maybe just maybe in this moment, you will hear him clearly say, that's what I want you to break. That's what I want you to give to me. And watch what I do next. Will you bow? As we bow our heads, as we close our eyes, push aside all the distractions, ask Jesus this. What jar do you want me to break?
you're here today or you've joined us online and if you don't believe that all your sins can be forgiven and that you are, can be fully accepted by a holy God and that you will get to spend eternity with him forever. If you don't believe that, if you doubt that in any way, I want you to break that jar of doubt today because the Bible says very clearly that when Jesus died on that cross, he said, it is finished. He fulfilled the work of your salvation on that cross. And by rising again, we too get to live with him forever just because we believe in him. And so if you're here today, I think the most important jar you will ever break is that barrier between you and Jesus that says, I just don't believe that. But if there's a part of you that says, you know what? I think it might be true. I feel it in my heart. God is doing something different in me. This might be that moment, that divine appointment, where you finally realize that all that Jesus ever did, he did it personally for you. And if that's true, I encourage you to pray to him right now and just say, Jesus, save me. I believe you died on the cross for me and that you rose again. And I believe that if I ask for forgiveness, you give it to me freely and forever. So I ask, please forgive me. Make me your child. I want to spend eternity with you forever. By praying that prayer or a prayer like that, you have taken a step of faith that has put you on a brand new journey of new life with Christ. And that's the best decision you'll ever make. But you will spend the rest of your days breaking jars. And so if the Lord whispered to your heart today, this is the jar I want you to break. I want to pray for you right now about that. Father, we come before you and we recognize that we cannot win the victory, that only you can win the victory. But we are willing to come before you and do what you've told us to do, to surrender to you the very thing that either we hold dear or that is holding us back from you and from your will. So, Father, I pray that you would give us the courage to break our jars. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.